Imagine dropping the old, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here, on a preschooler. And she said, you can leave her today, but she can't come back on Monday. It's the latest mix-up involving Colorado's new pre-K program. After a state senator complains about a towing company, the attorney general admits they've been under investigation for a while. A trucking company operating without insurance is involved in a wreck that kills five people, then rushes out to buy insurance within the next hour. The protesters who disrupted a pride event over the weekend have a relationship with local law enforcement. And I'll offer some thoughts about the show they put on at Pride tonight on Next. Colorado's new universal pre-K program continues to have some pretty elementary problems, like kicking a couple of kids out of full day pre-K after they'd already been in class for a week. Our Marshall Zellinger has done everything short of going undercover as a four-year-old to sort out these issues. It's the minion. <laughs> Lunch and a movie, the perfect pairing for any child. She was like, Mama, are you going to have to find me a new class? And all I could tell her is that I was working on it. Taylor Kiner did not expect to have her daughter Sawyer home so early in the day. Earlier this month, she got this email from Thunder Vista P through 8 in Adams 12. The email said, welcome to the classroom. This is who your teacher is. This is the name of your classroom. You'll be here from all day, which is 8 a.m. to 2 o'clock. Sawyer, who attended Thunder Vista for half-day pre-K last year, never matched with the school in the state's new universal preschool portal. But Taylor was on an email list for her daughter's full-day class. So she replied twice to make sure Sawyer was indeed enrolled. Yes, I still have Sawyer on my list. We do have Sawyer on our full day roster. They would have told me, oops, this was not right, or we hadn't gone to school there. I would not have pushed so hard. Sawyer missed the first day, but went to full day pre-K for four days that first week. The fourth day would be her last. She said, you can leave her today. You don't have to come pick her up but she can't come back on Monday. In an email she got from the district, Taylor was given some answers. The welcome back email was sent mistakenly. It appears that Sawyer's enrollment from last year was automatically carried over into this school year and a cross check and confirmation with the Universal Preschool portal was not conducted. We can't place Sawyer into a full day seat unless the Universal Preschool portal confirms a match based on eligibility. To be eligible for state funded full day preschool, families must be low income and meet one other qualifying factor. Earlier this month, Adams 12 said it would cover the cost for 96 low-income families who thought they were getting full-day funding until the state added that second qualifying factor. Taylor was not looking for free full-day, but the district told me tuition-based full-day is not an option. The district did find a spot for Sawyer in half-day at the same school, which she started today. She met lots of new friends. She had a great day at her half-day this morning. The district called it a clerical error that happened with two families. Why can't full day be offered to Taylor's daughter or the other family? A district spokesman told me because of interest in the half day program and current staffing, Adams 12 is not offering tuition based full day, but it is paying half a million to cover the cost for the low income families who had their full day funding go away when the state changed the rules. I mean, cl clearly there was a seat for her because her backside was in it for a week, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so the district added that it's not just two families who might want tuition-based mm -hmm. uh, preschool. And I assume, it didn't say, that if we do it for one, we might have to do it for everybody. But yep. that's, I kind of imply that, uh, that you can't play favorites. And since they're already finding seats for this mistake by the state, not mistake, the changing of the rules by the state, mm -hmm. and Adams 12 is saying, we're going to cover the cost for those, they're already doing more than is expected. But here you have one or two examples where it's like, couldn't you do one or two more? Yeah, that's where they decided to draw the line. All right, Marshall, thank you. So turns out the attorney general's office has been investigating why it's towing. They only acknowledged it today following a complaint here from a Democratic legislator who wrote the law against predatory towing. This investigation will give us a chance to see whether or not why it's towing has engaged in illegal conduct that took advantage of people. If the conclusion is that they did, we want to make sure that we can, however possible, Get people restitution. Get them their money back. Look how many books he has. As of last week, Democratic Attorney General Phil Weiser's office would not answer our questions about a towing investigation involving Wyatt's. But lo and behold, after State Senator Julie Gonzalez was on next talking about her personal experience with Wyatt's towing, the AG now says he's on it and has been on it. 
Senator Gonzalez claims that Wyatt's staff did not tell her about payment plan options. That is a requirement that Senator Gonzalez wrote into the Towing Bill of Rights passed last year. Nearly 1,000 people have filed complaints against Wyatt's with the Public Utilities Commission in the past year. The AG says future complaints can come to his office or can go to the Public Utilities Commission, the PUC. An attorney for Wyatt's told us today that that company is fully cooperating with the investigation and they believe that Wyatt's has followed the law. The trucking company, involved in a crash that killed five members of a family on I-25 last year, tried to go buy insurance minutes after the crash. Our Mark Salinger looks at how that affects what the family survivors could receive from a lawsuit. One commercial truck into a SUV. The pain caused on I-25 is still fresh. Not close to having any kind of justice for them. Desiree Everts and her son Hayden know finding closure after the crash that killed their family is not easy. It's just harder to get the justice that, that they all deserve. Five people in one car died. Colorado State Patrol says the driver of the truck didn't have a valid commercial driver's license. Police documents show the brakes were out of alignment and documents filed in federal court now show the truck also didn't have insurance. How does that even happen? Like, it, it just, it blows my mind. A man named Jesus Puebla faces five counts of vehicular homicide for the June 2022 crash. He ran into the back of a car stopped for traffic at 70 miles an hour. Lawyers representing the family say insurance had lapsed on the truck operated by a company called Caminantes Trucking. It's unclear when the policy lapsed. The crash happened at 1.27 p.m. on June 13th. Documents filed in that federal lawsuit allege the trucking company tried to add the truck to an active insurance plan at 2.50 p.m. that same day, just over an hour after the deadly crash. How can this happen again and again and again? Michael Leiserman is with the law firm for right truck now. safety. He's not involved in this case. What will happen is a truck company gets insurance, and then they let it lapse. When there's no insurance, the payout to the family of those who died becomes difficult to get. There are times when we are very frustrated and have to say there's nothing we can do. The federal agency in charge of regulating trucks declined to shut the company down after the crash that killed five, finding them only $21,460. I hope and pray that there will be justice sooner or later. The truck was carrying mail for the Postal Service when it crashed. It took months after the crash for the Postal Service to terminate its contract with Caminantes, even after they found out that the driver didn't have a license. Reached out to the Postal Service today, asked them why they contracted with a truck that didn't have insurance. Heard back from them just not answering any of our questions. This is just, this is so baffling. I mean, you think about trucking as like a heavily regulated industry. This is trucking with a federal contract. And you got a driver without a license, you got a company without insurance. Like how like how does this happen? Yeah, the short answer is that everybody always thinks that someone is watching over all of this, and sometimes no one is watching. Our reporting has found out that this trucking company actually got stopped before with different drivers that also didn't have commercial driver's licenses. They were still allowed to continue operating. Yeah. All right. Appreciate your continued reporting on this. Mark Salinger, thank you. This weekend, fewer than 100 people gathered together to select Colorado's newest state legislator. Because that's how Republicans and Democrats around here fill vacancies, and they happen a lot. The latest involved a Democratic vacancy committee, just 68 people, who appointed Democratic Socialist Tim Hernandez to represent a state house district in northwest Denver. Hernandez is a former DPS teacher. He inspired a student walkout when he was let go last year. He's led a number of different progressive protests on various issues. He is replacing Serena Gonzalez Gutierrez, who resigned earlier this year to take a seat on Denver City Council. So about a fourth of the legislators inside the state capitol were originally selected by one of these partisan vacancy committees, one fourth of them. Now, several of them have gone on to be reelected by the people. Colorado is one of only five states that uses a vacancy committee process to fill open seats rather than, say, waiting for a special election or having the appointment made by local elected leaders. Democratic vacancy committees are going to fill another one of these seats, maybe two in the near future. Senate Majority Leader Dominic Moreno left to go work for the city of Denver, so a committee's going to fill his job. And if they pick as his replacement, Democratic State Rep Daphna michelson Janay, well, then another committee will have to pick her replacement. Hey, you did something really meaningful for Colorado's refugee and immigrant communities last week. So last year, Next Viewers helped to establish the Ma Kang Scholarship in the name of the community leader who was killed by a stray bullet. And then last week, 
you all raised more than $10,000 to keep those scholarships going for a second year, going to new Coloradans who are turning the challenges of their lives into inspiration to pursue higher education in our state and make Colorado a better place. Do you know of another nonprofit cause anywhere in Colorado that could use our help? Would love to hear from you. Just a quick note is fine and we'll get going from there. I read every email that comes to next at 9news.com. It was just unfortunate that these men felt they had the right to frighten my children. Anti-LGBTQ protesters crash a pride fest claiming they're there to protect the children. Those kids' parents would like a word tonight. The fireball that lit up the sky then lit up our email inbox with you asking questions. So sorry to everybody who thought UFO. Turns out this has a very simple explanation. Why was everybody up in the middle of the night over the weekend and looking at the sky? Because how else did so many people see it? Astronomers say what so many of us saw at about 3.30 Sunday morning was a fireball meteor. I guess in this case, it was just somebody's Nest camera that caught it. So a fireball meteor is like a regular meteor, but, but bigger like a fireball. So most shooting stars that we'll see in a normal meteor shower are about the size of a grain of sand or like a pebble, but a fireball meteor can be like three feet across or larger. NASA says the annual Perseid meteor shower is known to produce the most fireballs, but they don't necessarily happen during the peak of the Perseids, which is almost two weeks ago. That, Danielle Grant, is exciting news for all of us who are just a little bit past our peak, but still trying to be exciting. <laughs> Yes, exactly right. And I love that, no, people were not up at 3 in the morning. It was the security cameras. Yep, they're, they're very vigilant, uh -huh. very vigilant. When you wake up in the morning, you're like, who was at my door at 3 in the morning? Yeah, it was a bug. At my house, it's always a bug. It's always the little spiders crawling across. Ugh. Uh, yeah, what a sight to see, and thank you so much for so many of you uh, filling up our inboxes for sure. I know this weekend also we had to deal with some scattered showers, thunderstorms out there. Tonight, yet again, we're watching out for maybe a few more rain showers up there toward Fort Collins. They've had some pretty dark skies. Another round of rain move, moving in and then further out to the west toward Boulder in and around the foothills. Another line just beginning to cruise down. It has been an active one north of downtown Denver, south of downtown Denver, right smack down here. It's been pretty quiet and calm. We do have that flash flood warning going for about another 15 minutes in parts of Larimer County. They've already seen about one to two inches on the ground with yet again another round of rain coming through as we speak. We'll zip on over to Weld and Morgan counties. Some heavy rain showers starting to sink to the southeast toward Fort Morgan. So keep that in mind. It's coming your way. Plus some pretty strong winds too. south of Colorado Springs looking at a few more scattered showers and thunderstorms tonight. Maybe one or two here in Denver about 839 o'clock. Otherwise we clear things out tomorrow morning. A beautiful Beautiful start to your day and no storms truly across the entire state. It's going to be a quiet day. Loads of sunshine and temperatures warming back to the upper 80s. We go still slightly below average, but not bad. Great as we wind down August with 80s here in Denver, 60s and 70s through the foothills. Oh, that summer heat. It's not going anywhere. It is back by Wednesday, mid 90s and then looking ahead to the weekend, slightly cooler, but still pretty dry as we head into Labor Day. Thank you, Danielle. Perhaps you heard about the military plane crash in northern Australia, Australia that killed three Marines over the weekend. We've just learned within the hour that one of them was from Colorado. The crash killed Marine Corps Major Tobin Lewis. Marine Corps says he's from Conifer. The military operation was uh, Osprey on a training exercise that crashed Sunday off the coast of Australia. 20 people went to the hospital. The military has not said what caused the Osprey to crash. Major Lewis from Conifer joined the Marines in 2008. He was 37 years old. Douglas County Sheriff's Office says they are still investigating the protests that disrupted pride over the weekend. Should be a pretty easy investigation because the Sheriff's Office has worked with these protesters. And almost 50 years after activists made public transportation open to all, Denver considers a lasting tribute to their courage. A plaque in Denver Civic Center Park serves as a memorial to the Gang of 19, a pioneering group of protesters credited with paving the way for accessible public transit. The new grant could help Denver Parks and Rec enhance that tribute. Tonight, City Council is expected to sign off on a $2 million grant to set up a new monument to the Gang of 19. Back in 1978, for two days, a group of disability activists blocked city buses at Colfax and Broadway, protesting the lack of accessibility. Already facing a lawsuit, RTD eventually agreed to make one-third of their buses wheelchair accessible. So if this grant is approved by city council, it would allow the city to set up a new monument at the Greek Theater near off Civic Center Park, where the plaque currently sits. Part of the grant might also help the city free up some space at Civic Center Park for other tributes. 
There's a $500,000 audit planned of two park statues that were temporarily removed. One is dedicated to Christopher Columbus. That was toppled during the social justice protests of 2020. The other, which includes frontiersman Kit Carson, was preemptively removed before protesters could take it down themselves. The group that disrupted Douglas County's Pride event that conservatives couldn't get canceled are from a, a group, an organization that works directly with the Douglas County Sheriff's Office. The Sheriff's Office has, it's investigating what went down over the weekend. Dugco Pride and its drag performances went on as scheduled over the weekend. Well, until the moment that dozens of men stood up to block the performance for more than 30 minutes before they were escorted out by security. Douglas County Sheriff's Office confirmed today that the protesters with a group called Able Shepherd. It is a tactical training organization that has recently partnered with local law enforcement, like Doco Sheriff, for active shooter trainings. Some of the parents who were there at Pride told us that the protesters with their Protect the Children t-shirts scared their kids. My kids started getting really anxious and then my middle child ran to me in the back and was sobbing. It was just unfortunate that these men felt they had the right to frighten my children. A second group was protesting outside the venue, carrying the signage and wearing the little costumes that are traditionally associated with the white nationalist hate group Patriot Front. They counter protest progressive events like pride parades and pro-choice pro protests. They're out of Texas. They turn up all over the country. We have yet to really see a ton of them in the metro area. Douglas County Sheriff's Office told us today they could not confirm whether these specific protesters are actually with Patriot Front. So there's a popular phrase among Colorado conservatives these days. We don't co-parent with the government. It's the idea that parents don't want public schools dictating certain things about what kids see and hear. That parents should choose what is appropriate for their kids. And that's what popped into my mind when I saw the protesters disrupting Doug Co. Pride over the weekend. Their shirt said, stand to protect children. But of course, their children almost certainly were not at the event. So they weren't protecting their children. They were there to co-parent other people's children to determine what they felt was appropriate for other people's kids based on their own religious and social views. Parents who say they don't want to co-parent with the government in public schools, they have the option of private schools or homeschooling. So what's the option for parents in Douglas County who don't want to co-parent with conservative protesters? We'll be back with your feedback next. The most Colorado thing we saw today is an epic finish of a tour de bruise. Remember Jeffrey Parker? He was the guy who was on a mission to visit all 477 breweries in Colorado tracking his trips on Instagram. Over the weekend, he got to the last one, number 477. Paonia United Brewing was his last stop. He likes to say that his favorite brewery is always the next brewery that he's visiting. So for the first time in a long time, one brewery will be aboard the leaderboard for quite a while. A note tonight from Eric Himmler, retired lieutenant colonel, who writes in to say that Colorado grieves for Major Lewis. Uh, he was the Marine who was killed in that Osprey crash off of northern Australia. Got that sad news tonight that he was one of the American service members killed there. A positive note from Bob, who writes in to say, every night is an event when watching, and that, Bob says, is a good thing. If you were watching Friday, we had back-to-back -back pieces of positive feedback for the first time in about five years, and I said I didn't know what to do with it. Lois wrote in to say, what to do with nice? Say thank you. Good advice, Lois. Thank you.